Hey friends, every Father's Day I find myself thinking, what in the world should I get him? Mom is still mad at me for getting him that new set of power tools two years back as he almost sawed his fingers off trying to remodel their kitchen. Then last year he almost blew the garage to smithereens with that discounted home brewing kit I got him. But this year, I don't feel nearly as nervous about the gift I have in mind for him because for today's video, I'm partnering with Manscaped.com. I think my dad is going to really like the Lawn Mower 4.0 I got him because with its built-in LED, keeping those hard-to-reach delicates groomed and tidy have never been easier. Plus, I know he's going to love the Weed Whacker nose and ear hair trimmer as he can push those torturous tweezers to the back of the medicine cabinet and breathe easy with nostrils that don't look like a small bird could nest in them. And with Manscaped's signature skin-safe technology, I'm not worried about him cutting anything off, be it his fingers or any other body parts. Plus, with both gifts being completely water resistant, I don't have to worry about him making dad soup if he drops them in his bath water. So, if you're stuck for gift ideas this Father's Day, head over to manscaped.com and get 20% off plus free shipping when you use the code Let's Read at the checkout. Now, without any further ado, on with today's stories. Let me tell you the story of how I developed social anxiety disorder. I used to work night shifts, so I sleep during the daytime and a few years ago I woke up to some pretty terrible news. I had a bunch of missed calls and unread text messages from my landlord. They were telling me to call them as soon as possible. I called my landlord and he tells me that there's a leak in the apartment downstairs, one that they figured was coming from my apartment. As a result, they'd shut off the water to my apartment while I was asleep. That meant no shower, no coffee. I couldn't even flush my own toilet. The only consolation was that I'd found a plumber to find and fix the leak, and he'd reimburse me the money if I kept a receipt or invoice. Now, it's already around 3 in the afternoon when I learned the news about the water being shut off, which was obviously coming up to the end of most people's working days. I knew of a few emergency plumbers who might be able to deal with the problem at short notice, but all of them seemed to be too busy to take the job. I ended up calling around to a few friends to see if I could stay at their place until the problem was dealt with, and luckily, one of my girlfriends was more than willing to take me in. But she also threw me a kind of Hail Mary suggestion as to where I could find someone who wasn't a pro, but knew enough about plumbing to be able to come over and help. Craigslist I didn't think it'd be much help. I mean, I figured most people would just use it to sell stuff and organize seedy hookups or whatever. But then again, I hadn't actually visited the site all that much. And to my surprise, there was a section of the services part of the site that was called Household. Then, what do you know? The third post down said something like, 37-year-old handyman looking for work with the post saying how he knew a little about everything and would take jobs at short notice at really low prices. It seemed way too good to be true, and I suppose that's because it was. I give the guy a call on the number he'd included in his post and explain the situation to him. Honestly, I expected that he'd give me the sorry, too busy line that all the others had. You'd think they'd at least arrange a time to take the job. But no, he seemed only too happy to drive out to me that evening to see if he could shut off the leaky pipe then go turn my water back on. I was literally like all my prayers had been answered. I mean, the guy even said it himself that it sounded like a relatively simple job and he was amazed another plumber hadn't come out already to just open up the floorboards, close off the pipe, then turn the water back on. I knew absolutely nothing about it so when he said opening up the floorboards or whatever and how that was a simple process, I just totally ate it up. About an hour or so after I'd made the first phone call, the guy shows up to my apartment and tells me he's outside. I realized that I'd totally forgotten to tell him which apartment I was in, so I let him know and I buzz him in. The guy then shows up at my door looking totally legit and I show him into the bathroom, 
which was where the landlord thought the leak was coming from. I then went back to my TV room and carried on preparing my very late breakfast. Remember, I worked night shifts at the time. A few minutes later, the guy, who called himself Tony, calls me into the bathroom and says something like, Does this look right to you? I then walk towards the bathroom, stick my head around the door to take a peek, and that's the last thing I remember. The next thing I know, there's a bright light in front of me, and I groggily realize that it's coming from the little pen flashlight of an EMT checking if I'm responsive or not. I start panicking, asking what's going on, and they tell me to keep still while they get a stretcher up to my apartment. They put me on it, wheel me out into the hallway outside, and there's the friend who had agreed to let me stay at her place. She's in tears, asking the EMT if I'm going to be okay, and I remember just relaxing and sinking into the stretcher when I heard them say, yes. I just felt like I wanted to sleep for days, but when I told the EMTs that I was feeling tired and could I just nap while they were driving me to the hospital, they kept telling me to stay awake, to do anything I could to stay awake. In the end, they kept asking me these dumb, small talk style questions to just keep me talking. Then at the hospital, I'm pretty sure they gave me something to keep me from drifting off because apparently falling asleep with a head injury can actually be fatal. And not long after, the cops showed up to take a statement about the plumber guy from me. They'd gone through my place and found a bunch of valuables missing, obvious stuff too like the TV being gone from the mount on the wall all my jewelry gone with my bedroom completely ransacked. Only then did I actually put two and two together and realize what had happened. That wasn't a plumber at all. He hadn't even touched anything in my bathroom. He just used the whole handyman thing as a front to rob people. One of the cops told me that I was the fourth person to get robbed by the same handyman guy that month, only because he uses different phone numbers and never told anyone much about himself. They hadn't been able to track him down. As far as I know, they never caught the guy. He just pulled a few robberies, then quit when the public got a warning about hiring anonymous handymen on the internet. Maybe he's still out there, robbing people, doing his thing, switching it up and not getting caught. And I hope those other people he'd robbed and beat got over what happened to him. But I didn't. Like I said, I developed a serious anxiety disorder after the attack, and it hit me in a way I just didn't expect. Bad things happen to good people sometimes, I know that, and I took a lot of comfort in knowing that the cops were at least closing the net around the guy. But then after I got out of the hospital, it must have been like two or three days before I realized I hadn't even left the house. I got nervous getting food from the delivery guys that dropped it off at my apartment building, but I figured that feeling would just go away after a while. Only, it didn't. I got this tight feeling in my chest, this itchy feeling all over me whenever anyone I didn't know walked outside my apartment or outside in the hallway. I still sometimes find myself running to the people with the gun I bought, staring through the little glass circle and just waiting to see the face of the guy who robbed me on the other side. I know I'm never going to see it either, but I still find myself doing it. I got a nasty little scar on my jawline from where the guy hit me, and even the EMTs said I must have had a steel skeleton or something because it's a miracle my jaw wasn't broken. But I guess I got a lot of scars that people can't see, along with a wound that I'm not sure will ever properly heal. So, way back when the PS3 first came out, I really, really wanted one. I mean, I wanted one bad. The main reason was because I wanted to play Call of Duty 3, which is still my favorite game series ever. But since my idiot self was slow on pre-ordering one, I was SOL when it came to the actual release date. I remember watching eBay like a hawk, scouring Craigslist every day, and day after day went by and I didn't have any luck at all. But then boom, I see this one post on Craigslist that said a guy was selling his brand new PlayStation 3 Call of Duty 3 included, and he's selling both of them for like 400 bucks, at least 100 below asking price. Only thing was, he needed to sell it ASAP, and he needed someone to drive over to him to pick it up. Person that could pay his asking price and pick up ASAP got the package. Somehow, I got lucky, real lucky, 
and a lot of folks were messaging him for it and sounded like they were going to rob him. I was older than most of the wannabe buyers. I could text him a picture of the cash and I could drive over to the Walmart parking lot that night to be able to pick it up. And I felt like a kid at Christmas. Granted that most kids don't drive to Santa to pay him 400 bucks to get their presents, but still, I was majorly excited to pick it up. Only trouble was, the guy was working late that night, so I'd have to drive over to the Walmart parking lot at like 2 in the morning so I could pick it up. I know what you're thinking. Walmart parking lot at 2 a.m. Something bad was always going to happen. And yeah, I'd be lying if I said it hadn't passed my mind when I was thinking about the whole thing. I think I made myself clear at the beginning though. I wanted that stupid World War II game, and the amount I wanted it outweighed whatever good sense I had. So, that's how I ended up in the Walmart parking lot in South Hanover, way, way after dark. Like I said, there was always a chance something bad was going to happen, I just figured it'd be from the other end of the law. I'm just sitting there, lacking, when I heard someone tapping on the glass in my driver's side window, and I saw the gun. I thought I was getting carjacked or something. They got me out of the car at gunpoint, but then when I saw the badge on the dude in plain clothes belt, I honestly breathed a sigh of relief at first. I knew my reason for being there sounded sketchy. Picking up a PlayStation 3 at 2 in the morning would have sounded really sus if I was a cop. But then when they pulled the 400 in cash out of my wallet and said that they were confiscating it as suspected earnings for drugs, I started to get real angry. I told them to search my car for drugs or guns or whatever they were looking for. If they didn't find anything, they had no right to take my money. One of the cops smirks when I said that though, screaming up in my face and threatening to smack me. His partner had to calm him down like he was legitimately worried that he was about to punch me. The angry cop walks back to their unmarked car and the other cop writes up a ticket for the cash they took. And while he does that, he apologizes for his partner and promises if I bring some pay stubs to the precinct, I'll get all my money back, no problems. I'm angry. I'm probably going to miss out on the PlayStation, but I figured the guys are just doing their jobs and getting it taken by them was much better than getting straight up robbed and carjacked by dudes that wouldn't have been so reluctant to beat me down. Because I figured I could still get my hands on the PlayStation, I drove over to the precinct first thing in the morning with some pay stubs, which I figured would prove the money was mine. I get there, hand in my ticket, and some cop walks out with an evidence bag with my money in it. Only right as she puts it down in front of me, I tell her there must be some kind of mistake. I tell her the cops pulled me out of my car and took exactly 400 bucks off of me, but in the bag, there was no more than a hundred. She then shows me the ticket, and in the little box that listed confiscated items, it says a hundred instead of four hundred. Right then, it was my turn to freak out. Like I couldn't believe that they'd do me like that. I started demanding complaint forms, numbers to call, all of that. The lady just thought that I was sizing up the amount, but I swear to God I had more money than that. So she gives me the number to call to register a complaint, which I do. I know, I know. Cops taking bribes around Baltimore is probably only raising eyebrows with the most naive of you, but missing out on the PS3 wasn't the scary thing. The scary thing was coming home from work three days later and seeing a car I didn't recognize parked across the street. I didn't immediately assume anything bad, I just wondered who in the neighborhood got themselves a new set of wheels. That's when I see him, the same plainclothes cop that wanted to tee off on me that night the same cop who took my money. He just looks at me, dead in the eyes, and smiles before driving off down the block. It was just like a warning or something, just to tell me he knew I made the complaint. If criminals or gangsters do stuff, it shakes you up, sure, but it makes sense. Those Johns are supposed to rob you or shoot you or whatever. But when it's the cops doing it, the same people who's supposed to protect you, who are you supposed to turn to? Back when I was about four or five years old, me and my mom went over to stay with my grandparents for the weekend. My dad left before I was even born, so it's always just being me and my mom, and my grandparents were always a huge part of my life growing up. We go over on a Friday night, then I'd stay till late on a Sunday, 
mainly so my mom could have a social life or work the long weekend shifts at her job. So this one dark Sunday evening around the holidays, I remember getting carried out to the car, like half asleep already, and then I don't even remember driving off because I must have been out like a light the moment I got strapped into the car seat. But then the next thing I remember, I feel the cold on my face, and I can hear my mom crying and begging someone not to hurt her because she had me in the car. I remember looking outside and seeing what I honestly thought was a monster at the time, but what I later learned was a man in a bunny mask. If you've ever seen that slasher movie, You're Next, it was kind of like the mask in that movie. Not some flimsy plastic thing. It was super detailed and really creepy looking. The guy's partner had basically stood in the middle of the road with his car at the side like he crashed it or something. Then when mom pulled over to help, he puts on a ski mask, his partner appears with a bunny mask on, and then proceeds to rob us before doing something unspeakable to my mom. And it almost killed her. And I mean that both literally and metaphorically. She spent almost two weeks in the hospital and I ended up living with my grandparents for almost a whole year because she was in and out of various institutions because it messed her up so bad. I hardly got away scot-free either, as I had nightmares about a bunny monster chasing my mom for literally years afterward, with that image being burned into my retina. But like with most things, time is the greatest healer and as I hit double-digit ages, things eventually got better and we started to live something of a normal life again. Cut to me being 24, still living with my mom, but looking for an apartment to move into because I got a decent paying job with my college degree. The place came unfurnished, so I was looking for cheap furniture and decor for the place, and one of the first places I started looking was Craigslist. In the for sale section, I started seeing some pretty sweet looking items for sale at bargain bin prices, so I contacted one of the sellers and discovered that it was some guy's granddaughter selling off a bunch of his stuff to pay for a care home. The girl seemed really nice, and she even promised me some kind of discount if I bought a bunch of stuff in bulk, which suited me because I needed the stuff fast, and I needed a lot of it. We arranged for me to go over to her grandpa's place to check some of the stuff out before I handed over the cash for them. So, this one Saturday afternoon, I drove over to the house to start haggling. She introduced herself, was really sweet, but when I saw her grandpa... I realized why they needed the money for a care home. He was in a really, really bad way. Like, I don't know exactly what was wrong with him because I didn't exactly ask any questions about his condition, but if you put a gun to my head, I'd have to say MS or something bad like that. He couldn't move from his wheelchair. He had an oxygen tank. He barely even reacted to his granddaughter introducing me, and he generally looked like he didn't have too many years left. I checked out the main three items on my list a closet, a desk, and a dinner table, and me and the granddaughter agreed on a price for them. I obviously had to arrange a U-Haul to go pick them up and all that stuff, but I figured I could arrange for the following weekend once we'd confirmed the purchases. Once that was done, me and the granddaughter had some coffee together and she explained that almost everything in the house was for sale. Apparently her grandpa had been something of a wild child in his youth, had been in and out of jail, and Although he'd led a much more regular existence after his final stint in jail, he hadn't got a lot saved up for a rainy day. It was a real sad story, and the girl went on to explain that everything they'd piled into the garage was for sale too, and if I wanted to take a look around in there, I was more than welcome to. So, at this stage I figured I'd just buy a few more things from them, maybe stuff they wouldn't be able to sell easily, knickknacks or whatever, so I could decorate my apartment while the money went to what I considered at the time to be a worthy cause. We finish up the coffee, the girl goes to help her grandpa out with something, and I head out to the garage to check out all the stuff that they piled in there. And boy do I mean piled. There was a literal mountain of what they considered garbage in there, but some of the stuff I figured I could find a home for. I'm talking stuff like old cookie jars, books, weird little ornaments, all kinds of different things. I start digging through the pile of stuff, placing some of the items I'd considered buying to one side when, suddenly, I spotted something that had me frozen in place. What had obviously been bright white was now dirty gray brown and all the paint in the eyes and in the mouth was old and peeling. 
but slowly and surely I recognized what it was. It was something I'd seen in probably hundreds of nightmares I had as a kid. Something that had traumatized me and my mom for years and years and years. It was a bunny mask of the exact same design as the one worn by the guy who'd almost taken my mom from me. I remember looking at it for a few seconds, then kind of stumbling back away from the trash pile in complete disbelief. I told myself that there's no way it was the exact same one. I mean, it looked like a mass-produced Easter bunny mask or something, definitely the same kind worn by that criminal, just not the exact same one. But then I started to piece it together, how Grandpa had been in and out of prison, and it all started to make a horrible kind of sense. I tried to pull myself together, and I think I did a good enough job of it to just bundle up what I'd pulled out from the trash pile before carrying it into the house to talk. I put on my fake a smile, paid for the stuff, then tried to make it sound as natural and innocently curious as possible when I asked the girl what her grandpa had gone to jail for. She was kind of taken aback and didn't know exactly, she just knew that he didn't talk much about it and neither did her mom, so she figured whatever it was, it must have been something he was pretty ashamed of. I then asked if I could go into the room with the guy to thank him personally, insisting when the girl said he might not be able to really hear me, and if he did, he probably wouldn't respond in any way. I said it was okay, still maintaining my composure as I insisted on going into his room to thank him. The girl must have thought I was pretty weird by that point. Sweet, maybe, but definitely kind of strange. Yet still, she let me go into her grandpa's room to thank him. I really did try my absolute best to maintain my composure. But by the time I got to the guy's bedroom door, my hand was shaking when I grabbed the handle to open it. When I walked in, there he was, sitting in his wheelchair, not even looking to see who walked into the room. His granddaughter had positioned him in front of a TV, but he wasn't really watching it. It looked like he was just kind of staring into space. I sat down on the bed near him, just kind of arranging my thoughts at first, and as I asked him my first question, I started to wonder what in God's name was I thinking. I asked him something like, Where were you living around in December of 1987? It didn't even get so much as a nod from him. He just kept this empty stare fixed on the wall in front of him. I actually wanted to just get up and leave, wondering if my questions would just end up confusing or upsetting a sick old man. But there was some part of me that just wouldn't let me leave without asking him the other questions. The scared little girl in me that wanted answers, who just didn't want to be scared anymore. I was hoping he'd say something, say anything to me about that mask I found in the garage. But as it turned out, I didn't need his words to know he could hear me. Then before I could even think to stop, I asked him, Did you rob a woman with a kid in her car back around Christmas time of that year? Nothing moved, but his eyes, which pitched up from the spot he was looking at as he began to stare at something else. But this time, it wasn't like he was just staring into oblivion. It was like he was thinking, remembering. I told him that his granddaughter had told me he'd been in and out of jail and although he hadn't told me exactly what for, that I thought I knew what one of the sentences was for. He stayed quiet, but his jaw began to gently tremble, almost like he was trying to say something but couldn't. What I said next was basically a lie. I didn't know it 100% but when I told him, I know it was you. His reaction confirmed it in my head. I know he was hardly capable of effectively communicating, but anyone else would have at least been indignant about the whole thing, maybe looked angry or confused. But even in his condition, he looked filled with regret. I saw tears welling up in his eyes as the frustration of not being able to talk began to overwhelm him. At least, that's what I figured his reaction was. I don't know if he wanted to tell me to go kick rocks or if he was sorry or what, but I didn't care for anything he had to say at that point. I just had one more thing to say to him before I got up and walked out. You almost ruined my life. You don't deserve to be in that chair. 
He actually let out a kind of whimper as I stood up and walked out. And when the guy's granddaughter stopped me to say thank you, I disguised the emotion I was feeling by telling her that myself and her grandpa had shared quite an emotional exchange of gratitude, and that I was sorry if I agitated him. I guess she thought it was kind of sweet, and I honestly hope she never finds out the truth, but after getting back into my car, I only made it about two blocks before I pulled over and just started bawling. I was filled with doubt. Like, the thing that got me crying was the idea that I might have just seriously distressed a sick old man. But this other voice in my head just kept saying, that was him. I know it was him. It had to be him. When I regained my composure, I drove over to my mom's place to tell her about it and we both cried together when she said she also thought it was the same guy. I asked her if anyone was caught for what happened to us and she said yes, that they were sent to jail as a result and she had to appear in court to testify. That was part of the whole reason I was staying with my grandparents during that period. The whole court appearance thing just weighed so heavily on her mental health. I actually had no idea anyone was caught for it up until that moment. I was always under the impression that no one had been arrested, and I grew up knowing better than to bring it up with my mom. I mean, I still wouldn't have ever really spoken to her about it if it wasn't for that chance encounter, and part of me wondered if she'd even really believe me. It was only when I described what the guy looked like that it actually clicked for her. As at first, she just refused to believe it. It seemed like the perfect karma for the guy. Like too perfect an end to a story and I don't believe endings like that happen very often in life. In the months that followed, it felt like a great weight had been lifted from our shoulders. Nothing could ever change the past or undo the trauma we both experienced. But knowing the guy was suffering in such a way was almost like proof that there was a God. I know that might sound a little unhinged, but I can't really think of another way to phrase it. I guess I still don't quite believe in happy endings, and I still think the world is a cold, cruel place, but I know from experience that there is such a thing as divine justice. Born in Philadelphia on March 23rd of 1961, George Weber fell in love with talk radio from a very young age. He dreamed of working in the industry, and for many years, he lived his dream by working at the WABC 77 morning show. George would read out periodic news updates throughout the morning, as well as joining in conversation with the hosts about those news stories, and those who tuned in became all too familiar with the sound of his voice. In April of 2008, George moved from WABC to the ABC radio network, and over the 11 months that followed his appointment, George focused on local interest stories that he personally investigated. To his co-workers, George lived a quiet and unassuming life, but after failing to show up for work on March 21st of 2009, it was discovered that George's private life was very different from his public persona. Naturally, on the Saturday morning that George failed to show up for work, his co-workers became concerned with his absence. On the few days that George took off due to sickness, he always called ahead, so by mid-afternoon, when George had yet to contact them, his co-workers called 911 and asked the police to check on him. On Sunday, March 22nd, two patrol officers arrived at George's apartment at around 8.30 in the morning. At first, they noticed nothing out of the ordinary, but on closer inspection, they began to detect the sound of running water from somewhere in the apartment. That alone wouldn't normally be any cause for alarm, but coupled with the fact that George failed to answer the door to the officers when the officers announced themselves, and it made for a very ominous situation indeed. Around 15 to 20 minutes after they first arrived on scene, the patrol officers forced their way into George's apartment and once they'd done so, they discovered a truly horrifying sight. George Weber was lying naked on his bedroom floor in a pool of his own blood. His arms and legs had been bound tight with rope, while his bloodied corpse had been mutilated by around 50 stab wounds to his neck, chest, and arms. The sound of running water was coming from the apartment's bathroom, and the blood around the taps and sink suggested that George's killer had attempted to clean himself off before escaping during the night. 
During the examination of the crime scene, the attending officers found no signs of forced entry, leading them to believe that Weber had both known and trusted his attacker enough to welcome him into his home. With this in mind, homicide detectives began scouring George's computer and phone in the hopes of finding any evidence of grudges or arguments between the victim and his friends or neighbors. This is how they discovered a message exchange between George and a 16-year-old high school student by the name of John Cateus. The text message threads and call logs taken from George's phone suggest that he and Cateus had arranged to meet on the night of Friday, March 20th, and that the purpose of the meeting had been less than wholesome. They had met after George posted on Craigslist that he was seeking a night of passion with a younger man and the timing of their exchanges suggested that Cateus had been one of the last people to see George alive. But after trying to bring him in for questioning, they discovered that the boy was less than willing to give himself up. Not only that, but a deep dive into Cateus's background brought up some very disturbing information. According to his social media profiles, John Cateus was a self-declared Satanist with a penchant for extreme sadism. And when the police reached out to the boy's family, they confirmed that John was a deeply troubled young man. Cateus' father was appalled by the allegations and agreed to take part in a sting that would bring his son to justice. The father contacted Cateus and convinced him to return to his East Elmhurt home to collect $300. When Cateus returned to collect the money, he was promptly arrested. At his trial, Cateus was charged as an adult and although he pled not guilty on a charge of second-degree murder, he was convicted and sentenced to 25 years to life. In the aftermath of his imprisonment, some true crime aficionados cited the Cateus case as an example of a lethal hate crime on homosexual men where the perpetrator exhibited some degree of homosexuality themselves. To them, it was a crime of projected self-hatred, but to others, George Weber's murder was something considerably more disturbing. Some argued that Cateus had targeted a desperate older man simply to secure access to his home. Then the guise of what we call a bedroom game, Cateus was able to bind his prospective victim before sacrificing him in the name of Satan. Others argued that rather than the murder being satanic, Cateus killed George when it became clear that he was a child abuser, and that Cateus's involvement with George was merely a sting to seek out and punish someone who was willing to sleep with an underage boy. It's almost impossible to establish any of these theories as fact, and all that Cateus' lawyer argued in court was the idea that George and his client had been involved in a long-term but violently unstable relationship. Whether or not this is true, the judge and jury took no mercy on the 16-year-old, who was condemned to spend the rest of his youth in a federal correctional facility. Maybe one day John Cateus will properly explain why he killed George Weber, but it's just as likely that the Weber family will forever be in the dark as to why their loved one had to die. In April 2010, a man named Jim Sanders uploaded a post to Craigslist advertising the sale of a small diamond ring. Jim lived in the small city of Edgewood in Washington State, along with his wife, Charlene, and their two sons, aged 14 and 10. Shortly after the advertisement was posted, Jim was contacted by a person claiming to be interested in purchasing the ring. Jim then invited them over to his home so they could view the ring in person before negotiating on a price. Then, on the evening of April 28th, a male and a female arrived at the Sanders' home, the same people that had called ahead to arrange the meeting. Charlene Sanders recalls them being affable, even a cute couple, who thought that the ring would make the perfect Mother's Day gift. After agreeing on a price, Jim Sanders asked how the couple would like to pay him, and only then did it become evident that they had no intention of doing so. The male half of the couple pulled out a firearm, catching Jim completely off guard and leaving him no choice but to hand over the ring. As Jim did so, the female half of the couple rushed to the back door of the Sanders' home, opening it to allow entry to two other criminal accomplices. The entire family was then corralled into the home's TV room, where the robbers made them kneel before binding their hands behind their backs. After the family were secured, the robbers demanded that Jim and Charlene reveal the location of additional valuables. 
I had a gun to the back of my head with a countdown. Three, two, and I'm just screaming and my kids are standing there, Charlene Sanders later said. I'm saying, please God, don't let them kill me. Don't let them kill my kids. Then they just rip my home apart. The robbers knew that the longer they stayed in the Sanders house, the more they stood a chance of being apprehended by law enforcement. So, with this in mind, they positively ransacked the house in search of anything worth stealing. One of the robbers remained in the living room, acting as crowd control, but it seems he was far more forceful and intimidating than was required. His threats to execute both Jim and Charlene were so convincing that their two sons became inconsolable with fear. They began wailing at the top of their lungs, so loud that the robbers became concerned that the neighbors might hear their cries. The robber responsible for controlling the family began to threaten the two boys with beatings unless they remained quiet, but this only increased their agitation, and their sobs grew even louder than before. Their disobedience incensed the robber, who became increasingly agitated at the refusal to stop crying, and he made good on his promise to beat the children mercilessly. Their parents were forced to watch a living nightmare unfold before their eyes. Charlene Sanders reacted by offering up her own wedding ring to keep her children from being beaten. That night was horrific, Charlene said. When they ripped my wedding ring off my finger, we just kept saying, just take what you want, just take what you want, don't kill us. Jim Sanders, on the other hand, had a very different reaction to the sight of his two sons being beaten. It seems Jim was initially rather pragmatic about the idea of his home being invaded and ransacked, as he knew that if he just kept his mouth shut and played for survival, the robbers would depart just as quickly as they arrived. Material possessions could be replaced. Damage to their home could be repaired. Gunshot wounds, however, are not so easily mended. Yet when the robbers began beating his children, when they began hurting what was most precious in the world to him, he was overcome by a burning, all-consuming rage. It's incredibly hard to break free from a tightly secured zip tie, especially when they're binding a person's wrist behind their back. But somehow, Jim Sanders was so utterly filled with fury that he managed to snap the thick plastic of the zip tie with nothing but pure brute force. In any other circumstances, Jim would have known better than to rush a man with a loaded pistol trained on him, but by that point, the red mist had well and truly descended. Jim found his feet, leaned forward, and charged his son's attacker, screaming as he ran. In the movies, the hero might dodge a few of his assailant's bullets before tackling him to the ground. He then ripped the pistol from their hands before turning it on them, using it to defend the family he'd worked so hard to raise. But life isn't a movie and Jim Sanders wasn't anywhere fast enough to outmaneuver the robber. The gunman stepped back, aimed, and put three bullets into Jim's body before he even got within six feet of him. For Charlene Sanders, it was the single worst moment of her entire life. I just kept saying, Honey, please stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with us. Don't go. Don't go. And he was just barely gasping for air, she said. My husband was a hero. He told his boys he would always protect his family and he died protecting his family. When they killed him the way they did, I couldn't believe it. But I was also in awe that the three of us were alive and I was praising God for that. Charlene might be able to talk of the subjects with a degree of magnanimity today, but at the time, she was beyond traumatized. And the men responsible for her husband's death weren't exactly faring any better. The murderer's accomplices were nothing short of horrified at what had occurred, and understood that, by that point, the situation was far beyond their control. A non-violent home invasion might soon become lost in a stack of incomplete cases, but a straight-up murder, the police would track them incessantly for such a crime. In the end, the robbers fled the bloody crime scene with cell phones, a laptop computer, jewelry, and an assortment of other valuables. And knowing the kind of heat which was about to come down on them, they drove south, all the way through Oregon until they reached California's northern border. A number of homicide detectives were assigned to the case, and it wasn't long before they discovered the robbers had made a single, fatal mistake. They had communicated with Jim Sanders using an email account tied to one of their real names. The suspects were then featured on the America's Most Wanted television show, and were named as Claben Bernard Joshua Reese, Kiyoshi Higashi, 
and Amanda Knight, four heroin addicts who were foolish enough to take the front license plate off the car they used to escape Washington. Then, shortly after approaching the city of San Francisco, they were subjected to a traffic stop and quickly arrested. In court, the suspects wept as they were charged with one count of first-degree murder, two counts of robbery, two counts of assault, and one count of burglary. Each of them entered pleas of not guilty and the raw horror and outrage they expressed left many believing it was a case of mistaken identity. But piece by piece, prosecutors tied the story together, proving beyond all doubt that the three men and one woman were responsible for Jim Sanders' murder. Finally, Charlene Sanders herself appeared in court, telling the judge and jury that there was no doubt in her mind that the four suspects were the people who invaded her home and killed her husband. Charlene's testimony meant that in 2011, all four were convicted on all charges, which each of them received sentences of between 71 and 124 years in prison. When confined to prison, one of the suspects, Kiyoshi Higashi, told a reporter that he deeply regretted Jim's murder, and that he prayed for their family on a nightly basis because no one deserved that. But when reached out for comment, Pierce County Prosecutor Mark Lindquist was quoted as saying, Talk to Charlene Sanders about who it was that came into her house that night. It wasn't somebody sheepish. It was someone willing to hurt and maybe even kill innocent children. Someone who had no problem taking their father's life before their very eyes. When 21-year-old Heather Snively discovered she was pregnant, she was over the moon. She and her fiancé, Christopher, had been trying for a baby for quite some time, and once she was expecting, she relocated from her native West Virginia to her fiancé's home state of Oregon so they could raise the child there. June of 2009 marked Heather's eight month of pregnancy with a baby boy she planned to name Jonathan, and based on written communication between Heather and her grandparents, it's quite clear that she was content, excited, and optimistic for the future. Like many expectant mothers, she planned intensively for the journey ahead, working to secure everything her baby might need in the months prior to its arrival. A friend had informed her that a great place to purchase cheap, second-hand baby clothes was the classified advertisements website, Craigslist, and during an initial search for baby clothes, she found there were rich pickings. Heather believed that Craigslist was nothing short of a miracle solution to her prenatal predicament, when in reality... Her visit to the site would spark off a chain of events leading to one of the most horrific criminal incidents in American history. During one of Heather's Craigslist browsing sessions, she happened across another user by the name of Karina Roberts. Karina was also in the market for baby clothes and, in the course of their conversations, the two women found that they were faced with a very similar issue. It seems that some of the baby clothes each of them had purchased simply weren't to their liking but neither had the time nor the energy to put the clothes up for sale again. It's then that they agreed on a simple yet effective solution to their problem. They would arrange a meetup in order to peruse each other's collections, then would exchange items they took a liking to. On the day of the proposed meetup, Heather drove over to Karina's home in Oregon's Washington County. It's safe to assume that she was excited to meet another expectant mother, as although she was excited for the birth of her first child, there's no doubt that the stress was mounting as her due date approached. She was also a fresh arrival in Oregon, so there's little doubt that the prospect of a new and supportive friend was one that Heather found deeply appealing. However, Karina would prove to be anything but a friend to her. And in fact, Heather's meeting with her would amount to the greatest mistake of her young life. At first, Karina warmly welcomed Heather into her home and a neighbor recalled spotting the two women laughing and smiling as they greeted each other in Karina's driveway. However, once Heather was inside the house, Karina's demeanor changed dramatically, and although it's not clear exactly how the incident began, the attack that Heather was subjected to was brutal in the extreme. Out of nowhere, Karina attacked Heather with a collapsible baton, smashing her around 30 to 40 times over the head until she collapsed to the ground. Forensic analysis later showed that Heather had multiple bite marks on different parts of her body, showing that at some point during the attack, 
Karina had dropped to the ground with her before savagely sinking her teeth into the poor woman's flesh. Yet as far as an indication of Karina's mindset, the bite marks are just the tip of the iceberg. For Karina was no kindly stranger or potential friend to Heather. She was a dangerously unhinged maniac, and she was obsessed with babies and childbirth. Once Karina was confident that she had snuffed out Heather's life, she calmly walked into the kitchen and retrieved a razor blade which she had stolen from her boyfriend's shaving kit. She then returned to Heather's body, knelt down next to her lifeless form, and began to carefully cut into the deceased woman's stomach. Over the course of the next few minutes, Karina Roberts performed a makeshift cesarean section, cutting Heather open before ripping her unborn son from her womb. After stuffing Heather's corpse into a crawl space beneath the house, Karina contacted her boyfriend's place of work and frantically declared that he needed to come home immediately. Jan Shubin, Karina's boyfriend, was all too familiar with his girlfriend's unhealthy obsession with having children, but to him, it was down to a tragic incident two years prior in which Karina had given birth to a stillborn child. Naturally, he was elated when Karina announced that she was pregnant with twins in November of 2008 and had watched as she began carefully planning for the arrival of the children. She watched dozens of YouTube videos which provided tips and hints on a smooth birthing process, and Jan even bought her the knitting supplies she needed to begin making baby clothes. She took prenatal vitamins, claimed she attended ultrasound appointments, and even took part in several midwifing classes in the event that she was forced to give birth at home. There was only one problem. Karina wasn't pregnant. She had faked the whole thing. Eight months after her lies began, she had everything she needed to begin her journey as a new mother. Everything, except a child. Jan was informed that Karina had an emergency at around 2.30 in the afternoon, and when he arrived home, he found his girlfriend lying in their bathtub, naked from the waist down, holding the lifeless infant in her hands. Jan did all he could to save the baby's life, even attempting CPR on the tiny, bloody fetus. But it was no good. The child had passed, and still under his veil of ignorance, Jan wept for the loss of the baby he believed was his. The next thing he did was contact local paramedics, and on their arrival, they were heavily alarmed by the amount of blood around the house. Believing Karina had suffered a life-threatening amount of blood loss, the paramedics rushed her and the lifeless child to the nearby Providence St. Vincent Medical Center. Since the reason of the child's passing was unknown, local police were called in simply as a matter of protocol. There were no official accusations at that stage and the summoning of law enforcement is standard procedure in such cases, despite it being extremely distressing for all involved. At the time of their arrival, Karina was under heavy sedation, so it was Jan who informed them that, to his knowledge, Karina had been pregnant with twins. This meant that somewhere back at his home, there was a second supposedly stillborn child in the residence that needed to be retrieved. Upon learning of the grim possibility of there being a second deceased child back at Jan's residence, two officers drove over to his home to conduct a search. Shortly after they departed, Karina's sedation wore off, and a team of doctors attempted to examine her. But to their alarm they were met with a stark refusal. Karina became extremely distressed, claiming she'd sue the hospital if the medical staff so much as put a hand on her. It took a while to talk her into it, but eventually, doctors were finally able to conduct the necessary examinations on the groggy but devastated Karina. Only instead of discovering the usual signs of internal trauma, the doctors determined that Karina hadn't given birth at all. The doctors then informed Jan of this rather unexpected and alarming fact, and as you can imagine, he was as confused as he was horrified. When he told the doctors that he wished to speak to Karina alone for a few moments, they were only happy to oblige him, and when Jan confronted her, she made a chilling confession. I did a horrible thing, she began, and over the next few minutes, she told Jan the whole horrifying story of how she'd murdered the pregnant Heather before slicing the baby from her womb. Meanwhile, back at the scene of the murder, police officers were searching high and low for signs of the second deceased infant. Suddenly, the radios burst into life, 
and it was then that they received the order to search the crawl space beneath the house for the body of a formerly pregnant woman. We can only imagine how harrowing the discovery was for the officers in question, putting two and two together, realizing what Karina had done. There was never a second child, only one that had been ripped from its mother's lifeless body. When the officers returned to the hospital, they immediately arrested Karina Roberts on suspicion of the murder of Heather Snively. It might surprise some of you to hear that Karina was not charged with the murder of Heather's unborn son. But according to Oregon state law, a human being is defined as a person who has been born and was alive at the time of the criminal act. It was impossible to prove that baby John was alive in the moments after he was ripped from the womb. Therefore, the state refused to pursue any additional murder charges against Karina. Chillingly, in the course of their investigation, police discovered that Karina had made attempts to contact several other pregnant women via Craigslist, as well as by several other forms of social media. She had made arrangements with three of them, but her other two potential victims had failed to show up. Heather was the third, and for her trust, she paid with her life. At her first court hearing in August of 2009, Karina sobbed as the accusations were read out. Initially, she staunchly denied having murdered Heather, but the following year, when it became clear that the prosecutors were seeking the death penalty, she came clean and pled guilty to one count of aggravated murder. Her frank admission meant that there was no trial, and a judge subsequently sentenced her to life in prison without parole. Karina's defense attorneys had attempted to secure an eventual parole, but the state's prosecutor rightly argued that a person capable of murdering a pregnant woman had no place in free society. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember to always clean your Craigslist crystals.